now want to talk about one of the cases that has been of uh, major importance in defining the parameters of the contemporary practice of statutory interpretation. And this case is called Pepper and Hart. The important thing to remember in relation to Pepper and Hart is that prior to this case, before this case, the courts had not been able to look at Hansard debates as an aid to interpreting statute. Now, Hansard debates are the official record of debates in Parliament. The rationale, the reason why courts could not make use of Hansard debates is normally given in the following way. The courts, as uh, I'm sure you can remember, the fundamental idea is that they literally interpret the law. They can't look outside the four corners of the Act. Once we say that the courts ha can make use of Hansard debates, records of what was said in Parliament when there was, say, a debate over the meaning of a statutory uh, provision, would obviously involve looking outside of the four corners of the Act, in other words, moving away from this form of literal interpretation. Pepper and Hart is important because in this case, the House of Lords took the opportunity to consider whether uh, judges should or sh indeed should not be allowed to use Hansard evidence when they were trying to interpret an act. The case held that judges were allowed to make access to parliamentary material and hence this would also mean of course that lawyers could make use of this material in their submissions to court about the meaning of uh, a statutory provision. However, the case Pepper and Hart went on to narrowly define the occasions when a court could make reference to Hansard. To enable a reference to Hansard, legislation must be ambiguous. To resolve the ambiguities, the court can make use of ministerial statements. This clearly means that the courts cannot make use of statements made by MPs in debate or argument, and that the statements themselves have to be clear. In other words, Hansard is a record of the debates, but there's only parts of Hansard that the courts could use. More specifically, um, they can only make use of statements made by ministers themselves, um, and that these statements have to themselves be clear, because remember what we're trying to do here is reconstruct the sense of an act. How can this approach be justified? As I say, this is a pressing question, because I'm sure you appreciate it moves away from the literal approach which stresses interpretation only within the four corners of the Act. Lord Brown Wilkinson, who gave the la leading speech in Pepper and Hart, began his judgment by reviewing the arguments as to why references to Hansard should still be prohibited. In other words, arguments that would be questioned. The primary reason that uh, Lord Brown Wilkinson drew attention to was constitutional. The courts must look only to the words used in the Act, as otherwise there is a risk of overt, explicit judicial legislation. Lord Brown Wilkinson then touched upon a related issue. Hansard materials may not be what he called forensically suitable, as it may be that they were said in the heat of debate or from a politically partisan position. The point here, again, I, I think this picks up on a point that we've um, encountered a couple of times. I mean, I'm hoping you remember uh, Lord Wilberforce's speech in Millie Angos and George Frank and Lord Scarman's speech in McLaughlin and O'Brien, where, again, this issue of what courts can and cannot do uh, is, is pointed out. The point that Lord Brown Wilkinson's talking about in, in Pepper and Hart uh, is related to this, uh, to the extent that he's saying that Hansard material may not be forensically suitable. It's material that comes out of debate, debate in, uh, on the floor of Parliament, which may be said in the heat of passion, which may be to do with uh, scoring political po points against uh, one's uh, opponents, rather than necessarily providing a clear statement which would allow a court to interpret uh, an unclear statutory uh, provision. All these reasons, then, are reasons why Hansard shouldn't be used. In other words, uh, what Lord Brown Wilkinson is saying here is that these are reasons why the law should not be changed. So then, what are the issues that compel change? It would appear, first of all, that the practice of judicial interpretation 
practice itself had already moved beyond the constraints of this old approach. The courts had departed from the old literal, literal approach of statutory construction and were beginning to adopt much more purposive approaches, seeking to discover parliamentary intention or the parliamentary intention lying behind the words used and construing the legislation so as to give effect to rather than thwart the intention of parliament. In other words, we find the intention of parliament in the purpose and we use that purpose to construe the words. Where the words used in the act by parliament are obscure or ambiguous, the parliamentary material in Hansard may through consi throw considerable light not only on the mischief, if you like, that the Act was designed to remedy, but also on the purpose of the legislation and its anticipated effect. Most interestingly, perhaps, Lord Wilkinson's argument also stressed that there's a historical shift in judicial interpretation going on. Now this, he argued, is due to the, imp due to the impact of purposive styles of European interpretation. Now I'm going to talk about these in a moment. Um, so I'm just going to pause our analysis of uh, Pepper and Hart there and stress the main points before picking up again on this issue as to why uh, European interpretation or the, European, uh, the interpretation of European Union or EEC law uh, tends to be purposive rather than literal. The point that I want to stress here is that Pepper and Hart is a symptom of change. The changes that Lord Brown Wilkinson is discussing in his speech suggest that that old practice of literal interpretation has broken down. And what the courts are doing now is looking to the purpose of an act. And in order to determine, uh, and once they've determined that what the purpose of the act is, they can use that understanding to uh, resolve any ambiguities that might be within the face of the act. It's as if then we've moved from this stress on literal interpretation to this stress on purposive interpretation. Let me stress and pick up on a point that um, I made earlier on in this lecture. This has to still remain within these constitutional boundaries. Now I'm not saying, I'm not trying to suggest that the judges of, uh, or the courts have become sovereign. I'm trying to suggest that the impact of European Union law and European human rights law have led to certain changes in all elements of uh, judicial practice but more specifically in relation to statutory interpretation that um, sees the judges becoming much more active, much more purposive in what they're doing when they are interpreting a statute. The devil is in the detail. So I think in order to make most sense of this point, what I can next best do is turn to the impact of European methods of interpretation on the common law. Let me stress one point that is often misunderstood here. What we're concerned about in this part of the lecture is the impact of uh, European methods of interpretation. And those methods of interpretation relate to European Union law. Now, we can say EU if we go to a slightly earlier period. It's, it's referred to as the European Economic Community, the EEC. Um, but obviously, in so doing, we are not talking about, we are not talking about the European law of human rights. I'm going to come on to that point separately and later on. All I want us, us to think about at the moment is the impact of European methods of interpretation on common law methods of interpretation. And I suppose you already have the key point, the point that I want to elaborate, and that is that these methods are purposive. Now, there's a lot of history that lies behind this point. In other words, why is it sh uh, that it should be the case that uh, European legal traditions tended to favour a purposive form of legal interpretation, whereas common law methods of interpretation didn't. Slightly uh, misleading to put it in that way, as if you look at historically common law methods of interpretation, they always had purposive aspects. So I think one has to be a little bit careful here. However, at the same time, I think you can say that from about the uh, uh, mid-70s onwards, Judicial methods are changing and begin changing much faster as more and more European Union law is uh, impacts upon uh, common law, thus stressing these uh, tendencies within common law that have preferred purposive rather than literal interpretation. 